And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Reverend Debbie Grace, founder of the Divine Union Foundation and Divine Union Academy, who specializes in ancestral healing. She has had two NDEs and five walk-ins, which we're going to talk about today. Devi, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd also like to honor a couple of other organizations that I partner with. Mm -hmm. The first is uh, Beyond Being Human and also the Galactic Alliance and also Ancestors Within. And I will be referencing them throughout our interview because my personal experiences are also a part of this much larger cultural transformation on the planet that those three different organizations are supporting, like the evolution of the species. And so I do have a classic background in near-death experience studies, particularly childhood near-death experiences. And then there is this other layer that you've also had in other interviews where a walk-in transpires during that big pilgrimage. And for me, I talk about the fact that my walk-ins are a part of my oversoul. So have you ever used that term on the show yet? Mm -hmm. I've had two guests that claimed that they have, one of them I think actually says he is currently a walk-in. And I can't remember what the other one said. It was probably 200 NDEs back. (laughs) But uh, I would like to know what your definition of a walk-in is. Well, I'd love to highlight Lee Carroll, who's Cryon. And basically, he's promoting for those of us that go through these different kinds of spiritually transformative experiences, walk-in fits into that category. And he basically said, imagine that you get to meet your future self and that your walk-in is like a quantum time traveler and it's an aspect of your highest self and it's jumping into this space-time continuum to accelerate your evolutionary awakening. And then it doesn't create that separation, right? Because when some people think of the term soul transfer or soul exchange, you know, they think of, you know, one consciousness departing and a completely new consciousness coming in. And for some people that may be their truth. However, for me, because I've had five, right? I was shown that these are different gradations of my eternal consciousness. And each time I had a near-death experience walk in, or a close brush with death, walk in, my consciousness is picking up its velocity, its speed, it's raising its frequency, and bringing in more of that multidimensional intelligence or multidimensional capacity to handle the issues or the challenges or the situations that humanity most needs a support with. In my case, it's all healing the ancestral family tree of life. So even before I talk about, you know, how I died or you know, what occurred in the near-death experience, I create this context of like, there are ancestors that we all have and that some of them are healthy and some of them are not healthy, right? You have your assets of your allies in the ancestral lineage. And then you also have the souls that are very asleep, right? Or very challenged. And so in order for us as a human race to awaken, to the human divine or sapien divinus or homo luminous or uh, homo noeticus as it's called, that new divine human presence, we've got to clean up where there's been a lot of density or uh, a lot of shadow in the family systems. So has anybody ever talked about these issues before in your broadcasts? I know for sure that the one guest that claims to be a walk-in was not a walk-in from his higher self, but a completely different being. And that's what my assumption of the definition was. For example, if you had an NDE and I took over your body, you know what I mean? That's, that's only one kind, right? And so that's why there's this larger canopy of spiritually transformative experiences And there's the association, the American Center for the Integration of Spiritually Transformative Experiences. And so in my case, there is this purity of intent to raise the frequency of love to overcome where humanity has been experiencing a lot of separation. So like my deaths were very, very violent. 
they were a result of family trauma patterns. And so I actually died at the hands of family members. However, those family members weren't acting as isolated individuals because we have patterns that get passed down generation after generation. And so they call it the ancestral baggage that was actually the cause of my death, if that makes more sense. It's not like a, you know, anaphylactic shock or it's not a, you know, a appendix bursting or it's not a car accident. You know, it's somebody that I loved and trusted and there was this backlog of ancestral negativity that hadn't been resolved. And so it comes like a train wreck, right? And starts crashing into the lives of the descendants. So we have the sayings, you know, the sins of the father, right? Or we lived upon the sons or the grandsons. It's usually about three to five generations before things get really, really messy. And so I was only four years old the first time that I died. And then I was 10 years old the second time that I died. And of course, when I went up into what we would call my soul review or my end of life review, I sat with all these luminous beings of light and I traveled through what you would call like interstellar portals. The examples that I give is kind of like that um, portal energy that you. So you said, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to give you an example of portal energy. I think that was the last word and then I lost you. So if you want to go from there. Sure. I was using the film interstellar. So if you've seen the beautiful graphics that they did in that screenplay and movie that's moving through that vortex energy. The other famous portal is Jodie Foster in contact, right? When she traveled through those gateways and was teleported into that other reality. And then other people have watched like Coco or um, the book of life and their heroes travel through like these stargates to get to these other worlds. Uh, the land of the living or the land of the remembered. And so for me, it was kind of like traveling through a wormhole within what the tree of life people call the Bifrost, right? And you go through this passage in the great tree of life or the world tree. And then I was escorted into other dimensions that vibrate at a much higher frequency. And they are not associated with like any particular realm but they are also known as the realm of the illuminated ones. And so my end of life review was facilitated not by avatars, but by this massive ancestral council, kind of like what you saw in Star Wars when the Senate meetings would have their huge gatherings and there was like thousands of seats. So it wasn't like a council of 12. There was thousands and thousands and thousands of ancestors and so that was specific to my assignment, right? Which is also helping heal the family system for the planet. And you could see that, you know, between age four and age 10 on a human timeline is like a, a drop in the bucket. Um, out there, there is no time. And so I had to go back from 1977 to 1983. I had to have another meeting, right? With these ancestral councils to discuss the unresolved issues in the family system. And the primary issue that we were addressing is the imbalance of power between the masculine and feminine energies, where there was like a split in the family system, where there was like a conflict between the mother and the father. And then it just has like gone on copycat, right? Or some version of some form of a disagreement between masculine and feminine energy of all ages. And so I was a child, the, the person who took my life because I was strangled to death, I couldn't breathe, um, you know, was much older than me, but it was still a dance, right? Between what you would call the aggressive or toxic masculine energy, and then the more vulnerable or um, submissive, right? Feminine energy. And those are very large archetypes, which is bigger than just the two of us that had this archetypal experience of, you know, one person was the oppressor and one person was the oppressed. Do you think this ancestral pattern was passed through behavior, DNA, or energy? All three. The, the behavior patterns get stored in what we call cellular memory. And then the DNA, as Robert Sheldrake has said, 
has telomeres, which means that the DNA of the whole species, you know it's a big word, has a morphogenetic field, which means that my DNA can talk to the DNA, right, of any other two-legged on the planet. And then, because we know about um, fields of consciousness, there are also energy imprints that are thought forms or collective belief systems, or they call them memes. And those are imprinted programs or um, biological, they call them limbic birth imprints, and they get passed down, right, in the womb space when the, the fetus is, you know, absorbing all of those ideas and perceptions and concepts and feelings and attitudes and you name it, right, while they're gestating in their mother's belly. So by the time that they arrive on the planet, they already have what uh, Bruce Lipton calls an epigenetic set point, which can be renegotiated. However, it's stored in your amygdala, it's stored in your hypothalamus, and it's literally stored in your uh, cellular membrane. And then through these near-death experiences, it's like my whole vessel was given an upgrade. Like you went from 1.0 to like, you know, 105.0 because the, the jump of the frequency, like my birth name was Natasha, and then this consciousness of Gayatri walked in, which is an aspect of the Divine Mother out of India. And so it was like, to heal the family challenge, a huge frequency or a huge vibration of the sacred feminine walked in to me at age four. And then when I died again at age 10, a huge frequency of the divine masculine or the divine father walked into me. And then that being was called Samavesha. So it was like healing the wounded mother programs at age four, and then healing the wounded father programs, you know, at age 10. And then by the time that I had my third close brush with death, which was all the way back in 2014, it was like, okay, so now how can we bring this divine feminine and divine masculine energy together into a sacred marriage inside of my body? And so it was all about sacred union or all about alchemy or all about integration. And so the way that it's progressed, it's like I had these essential healing components installed right a b c and then d was moving into that space where not only am i an example of this divine blueprint of the sacred marriage inside of myself then i started modeling it in what we would call the grid system or the ley lines of the whole planet so it's like our bodies have meridians and energy pathways and naughty channels. It's kind of like the yoga of your body. And once I mastered that integration of the divine marriage of the awakened feminine and the awakened masculine from childhood, because it took me a lot of decades to integrate it, then it was also about stewarding what you would call the ley lines for the planetary body, which transmits information to all of the residents. So I had what you would call re-returning visits to these councils that are supporting the human race to progress out of these entrenched forms of duality or these um, reoccurring challenges that we see again and again of polarity. And so the whole point of all of my deaths was to actually synthesize unity consciousness. We call it moving out of separation consciousness and into unity consciousness. And some people have seen that our ancestors are not just human. So that ancestral council that I visited, they had all of these exquisite, elaborate masks. And they were very radiant. And I was like, okay, you guys aren't my human ancestors. You know, you come from some other realms. And then they announced themselves as we are your star ancestors, right? Or your celestial relatives. And then this is what many of the Native American or indigenous populations have been documenting about their star grandmothers and their star grandfathers, right, up in the heavens. And so when I started telling my story, the people that really got me first was the First Nations, wisdom keepers, the shamans, right, the cities, the very gifted saints, what, you know, 
illuminated medicine men and medicine women, they were like, wow, you know, you went and talked to them on our behalf. Okay, thank you. <laughs> it's very, very important. But it wasn't like I was just being exposed to, you know, what they call a um, enlightening near-death experience. I was actually advocating kind of as a, like a cosmic lawyer advocating for where humanity was experiencing numerous breakdowns and where we needed more help. And so part of my role wasn't just to experience, you know, the infinite all because I'm already, you know, very well connected on all those levels. It was like, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and get down to, you know, the brass tacks of where's the breakdown occurring and, and how can we resolve this loop, right, of what you would call transgenerational uh, violence that's unnecessary because we we know that the power of love is the the sanctification of life and if you have that kind of a breakdown within a family unit right the loss of safety or the loss of of power because like when you die right i lost all my power then it's like how do you bring back the sovereignty of the soul and i was not like receiving from this deity that was um coming from pure source energy, I was being greeted also as an ally for this entire commitment to set humanity free. So I kind of felt like a female Moses, like I was sent with the um, prime directive, you know, let's find a way to set my people free, <laughs> you know. And so there was also avatars, right, what you would call the great deities, that were also mingled in amongst, you know, the ancestors and the star ancestors. And it's like, everybody was collaborating or co-creating. This is it. This is the generation where we're going to neutralize this harm and, and love wins and love is going to find a way. So we started working with what you would call the intelligence of the laws of grace. And then in that second near death experience, which happened actually on earth day, so I'll have my anniversary on April 22nd. I was introduced literally to this field of consciousness that's called the Arc of Grace. And it's an astronomical frequency of divine intervention. So you could say that each time that I died, I went and recruited more love and more grace to import, like an import business, and bring that back into the human genealogy, anatomy, and physiology raising the frequency of my body and also purifying all of that trauma for generations past. So now we'll pause because I don't know what people are hearing because this is a lot of information all at once. But as you can see, it's, it's a very large scale initiative. <laughs> for most people, whenever they reincarnate and come back, that's when they possibly would come back with an upgraded version of themselves. But yes. you've had all five so far in one lifetime, right? Yes. And that is to prove that the laws of grace supersede what you would call the old or traditional laws of karma, of cause and effect. So it's like I took the hit, right, at a very young age. And then it was agreed that, quote unquote, by the time I reached age 50, that I will have gone through five upgrades so that I could vibrate in this frequency of benevolent stewardship to escort many human families that have been struggling with this same issue. They just don't publicly discuss it, right? Because it's like taboo <laughs> uh, to realize that they haven't done anything. I lost you again. You were going to say that they haven't done anything. And then I think you were going to say wrong. Wrong. <laughs> These situations are like a reoccurring echo that need and require resolution. And if we just have brave enough souls that agree to be a part of the cleanup, rather than pointing fingers, then we can get that old energy to transmute. In Hawaii, they call it ho'oponopono. And it's a deep, deep ceremony of forgiveness. So I started doing the ho'oponopono ceremony about Hmm. two years before I had my third walk-in. And that was from, you know, a Huna shaman that was looking at it in terms of, 
you know, the many branches of the extensive ancestral tree of life, which was discussed in the Black Panther, right? The comic strips and also the Black Panther films. And so King T'Challa, you know, really had to change some of the mistakes that his predecessors made and really stand up and challenge, right? Their choices or their decisions and create or carve a new path. And so that was a very bold move. And I could very much relate to these epic legends, right? I started studying the myths at about age 28 because I was told that I was destined for a very large global service and that I needed to start studying the mythos to comprehend, you know, my, my Shiro's journey. And like you said, yes, it's lifetimes within lifetimes all stacked in the same, right, incarnative quest. Yeah, this is analogous to the quest for the Holy Grail. I would assume that at least three quarters of the people on this planet are suffering from ancestral problems. So you're going to, you have a huge job ahead of you to try to clear out or try to help the entire planet. What can you do practically to do this? Well, number one, the first catharsis that happens is when people actually comprehend ancestral science, they actually forgive themselves. Their, their capacity to self-love when they realize that there's a much larger energy field that's been impacting their manifestations. It's not just their karma. There are ancestral karmic imprints. And that means that the descendants are partially innocent. And once people get that this isn't, you know, all on their shoulders, there's like this sigh of relief of like, okay, <laughs> great. It's not just right. My responsibility. And then we get smart about enrolling or employing the additional assistance that's already pledged to purify what we call the dross and have them have these awakening experiences working with their allies, which is their own highest self, which is their positive ancestral allies, which is also what we would call their helper spirits, right? Their team that they incarnated with. Um, I particularly work with at least a minimum of 444,000, right, of their guides, of their allies in the spirit world. And of course, it's all being organized by what's uh, radiating into the highest self, which is that I am presence. And the I am presence has access to all of their lifetimes. So we go into what we would call the great book of life. Um, and we're outgrowing the old Akashic records. Part of my gift is helping people to zero point those old Akashic record timelines. It's timeline therapy, right? And getting it into grace point and realizing that that is a dispensation of divine intervention that they're worthy of. So once people figure out that they're actually innocent, then they psychologically start to realize that they're worthy of receiving miracles. <laughs> <laughs> because transgenerational ancestral healing is at the level of the miraculous quantum physics. Like I can't explain to somebody's human brain, the skill sets that I have is that they're at the level, right? Of the technology of divine miracles. However, it gets the job done, right? So there's bravery and there's willingness and it's people starting to realize you can see it once you believe it. And if they believe that the laws of grace are real, right, that they're not constantly having to cleanse, quote unquote, their own karma, that there can be this quantum leap of miraculous love and grace, then it's like, great, you know, we're not just left as a species to figure um, our way out of the quagmire. And a lot of people have documented that the, the human species was altered without our permission. Right. And I don't need to get into all of that, you know, <laughs> multidimensional espionage. However, there's this huge impetus to bring in the necessary support to kind of level the playing field because we were tampered with, <laughs> you know, and I just call that fierce grace. Us females, we call that fierce love. And so I'm like advocating uh, to neutralize a lot of people's distorted or false soul contracts. So if you talked about that at all in your shows maybe but i wanted to ask you this 
a lot of people think that we're in the ascension or the ascension's going to be coming up. And I was wondering if that once all these people heal ancestrally, that that will usher in the ascension. It's a great way of putting it. We can think of this unfinished sludge, right, in the the bones, right, of the unresolved karmic imprints that are at the level of an archetypal pattern or archetypal programs. So once you clean up your ancestral stuff, then you got to clean up the archetypal stuff. The two primary archetypes is the split between the victim and the victimizer, right? There are no victims and there are no victimizers in the transcendent, right? (laughs) Oneness of the original unified field. That's before we uh, take on our roles, right? Or our character uh, traits upon arrival for these different experiences of contrast. And so it's the personal purification, right? Of your soul records, cleaning up your own Akash. Then there's the cleaning up of the ancestral records. Then there's the cleaning up of the archetypal, right? Issues. And then you have to clean up the grid system of the whole planet, <laughs> which is the ley lines, right? Or the nervous system of the biosphere and as people do their individual healing ancestral healing and archetypal healing then you're starting to clean up what we would call um the living web of intelligence within the planetary body and we don't go through an ascension without the planetary body being ready and she can't possibly fire up right into her graduation or or her metamorphosis kind of like the planet going from a caterpillar into a butterfly if she still has all this sludge right in her um, energy pathways and so people don't realize that as they transform themselves they're also transforming the ecosystem that they live in and this is why we had the name of the earth guardians right or the the magi the ancient magi that are the earth stewards and that was quite a literal position and so in 1983 because i died on earth day it was moving the conversation with all of these benevolent beings that are here to steward the planet into her destiny so it was like we were talking about the destiny of the world soul of the entire biosphere, which some people call mother earth. The indigenous people have it Pachamama Pachatata. And so in the second near death experience, I physically talked to the soul of the whole planet because I wasn't going to come back. I was like, you can't get me to go back right into that matrix reality because it's just, it's too um, thick, right? With patterning. And she said, do you want to come back and help me self-actualize regardless of what the inhabitants are doing? Can you just focus on getting in here and midwifing me? Because if you midwife me, then I can midwife them. So can we upgrade your assignment to you are now a planetary midwife, right? And then we'll delegate a lot of this ancestral healing to other support structures. And it was like, They pitched me with like a new job. And I was like, okay, I see your point. So this is moving into the planet, having her freedom and her liberation and her awakening process. And that was identified as the most efficient timeline that I could be, right, dropped back into. It was the arc of grace within the planetary body, not just for the human species that translates. Earlier, you were talking about all this cleaning. Isn't some amount of cleaning happening in the in-between of lives? Yes, and that's a very beautiful reflection, the the life between lives. And there's this like alpha and omega point, right? You have your pre-birth planning, and then you have your end-of-life review. And so, yes, in the in-between, there can be many epiphanies, lots of realizations. And a lot of those are made available because you can reflect on, so what was your pre-birth planning, right? What was your intention for your Dharma and whether you experienced 
um, setbacks or delays or distractions. Most people get distracted, right, by their personality or their identity. The primary issue is the amnesia, the forgetting. Come in with your pre-birth planning and then the amnesia sets in or the forgetting and the distractions. And so a lot of the end of life review is like, so how can we make it easier for you to incarnate and retain that remembrance that you remember who you are and you remember why you came. And a lot of that can be worked on in the in-between of maybe I can choose, right? A different family cluster to incarnate into and receive, you know, more support and assistance from nature or different kinds of allies during my developmental years so that I don't, you know, get drawn, quote unquote, off my path so easy <laughs> that need to, you know, loop back in to that primary intent. So that's a good point. Do you feel that all of us collectively and the planet started out as perfect or in paradise and degraded down to what we are? Or we started from dystopia and are working our way towards paradise? Well, because a quantum field doesn't reside in a linear framework, think of it as a spiral realization. They have said in, in quantum physics that there are no past lives. It's all happening simultaneously in quantum parallel. So is a, a part of us our species, very connected to source energy, very aware of the truth of our eternal presence and willing to bring that divinity down into our body? Yes. Are there also other timelines where that has gone into almost complete and total forgetting, right? Those are the densities. And so that's like an area of development that is running what you would call lower self programs. And yet the highest self isn't necessarily, quote unquote, the original pattern of perfection. The soul takes on this agreement to experience all these different scenarios of both what you would call pain and pleasure. And then there comes a point where this quickening of depth and maturity realizes that we're no longer going to be run by that pain pleasure mechanism. And that's usually when the consciousness begins to understand that <clears throat> the act of humility, the act of surrender from the human personality to the divine presence is that more conscious path that we can return to, but it's not linear. It's like spiraling back to that remembrance that there was always supposed to be a vertical marriage where the lower self and the highest self are absolutely designed to partner and marry and cooperate. And we don't have to have this big, right, diagonal schism where the lower self is off, you know, pursuing all of its own um, agendas. And it's ignoring, right, its original design. And so in some sense, we're coming into this access mundi, which in the tree of life is called that perfect spinal column alignment. And to explain that in quantum theory of the synthesis or the aggregation of all those timelines, the grace point is the access mundi. When all of these confluences reach zero point, then you really come into aligned mastery and all of these other learning curves, right? Yield and kind of like the snake that molts its skin, right? It's still your consciousness on this evolutionary journey. However, you're no longer radiating towards um, what you would call extremely positive experiences or no longer attracting yourself towards, you know, very negative experiences, you realize that life is about balance. And like they discussed in the Harry Potter screenplays or also the Star Wars screenplays, there was the metaphor of the prime Jedi or the, the metaphor of the middle path, 
that we all have light and dark inside of each and every one of us. It's just, what do you choose? So that soul that's kind of been spread, you know, to one side of the equation over here or spread to one side of the equation over here. It's like, can you walk that space of wholeness? And in that space of wholeness, do unto others as you would wish them to do unto you in that space of wholeness of like, yeah, I could go either way. I could go lighter. I could go dark. So what's actually going to serve life? That my actions, choices, and behaviors are going to uplift all the people that I am coming into contact with, as well as also elevating my experience. And that's true co-creation. So everyone's still learning, right, through stark contrast to actually master a bridge of collaboration and co-creation where we recognize, yeah, I could kill somebody. Am I going to go down that journey again? No, thank you. Right? Been there, done that. <laughs> you know, that's why people are, you know, joking about, oh, remember the day where, you know, they were hoodlums and villains and criminals. And, you know, it's like you outgrow those stages because all you are really doing is, is hurting yourself. And the the Cloud Atlas book brought that into beautiful, pristine awareness when you could see the soul group traveling through multiple timelines and multiple lifetimes where they're all like trading places, right? All to realize these fundamentals of love, integrity, respect, honor, consideration, compassion, basically choosing those more heart-based virtues. So didn't really answer your question in a traditional way. However, I hope it invites people to ponder. Do you think this timeline that you and I are sitting here speaking in is about fixing things or about creating balance or both? You could also say that creating balance is unveiling what alchemists call the magnum opus. We each come in with our original set of instructions. And because of free will, you can ignore a set of instructions, right? And the optimization of the species is when everyone is agreeing to let pure love frequency pour, drench, saturate into their body, activate those original set of instructions, and then everyone is choosing love with themselves and each other because those personal set of instructions then empower each other's destiny paths. We don't have individual destinies. We have collaborative destinies. And so in some sense, think about my original human personality needed five other aspects of my own soul or my own highest self or my own oversoul just to get me back on track, right? Where because of my ancestral issues, it was going to be completely impossible for me to fulfill my destiny, right? Given the situation that I came in. And so I'm here to prove that miracles are exponential, that you can come in, right? And some of the lowest frequencies, right? Of any family system. And through that divine intervention, through the laws of grace, you can upgrade yourself, right? Gayatri, one walk in, Samavesha, next walk in, Moksha, next walk in, Devi, next walk in, and grace, right? The final walk in. And I'm still integrating all five higher self aspects just to get my original human personality back on track. <laughs> And so I'm like a guinea pig, <laughs> right? Like, so if I can do this, then these accelerated assistance pathways, grace pathways, can literally be made available for others. Kind of like the geese, right? At the, the front of the flock and they're creating the headwind. I'm carving a path so that these laws of grace can then ripple out and radiate out to many others who wouldn't have the fortitude or the stamina, right? To bust through that resistance to love. Love is the prime directive. However, there's a lot of ancestral conditioning that actually fights or resists love. It doesn't trust it, right? We call, you know, love that has a future, right? Is a healthy family 
pathway. And that's why Bert Hellinger brought in family systemic constellations. And so I've done what you would call parallel quantum family constellations to release this resistance to love that multiple family systems were stuck in. And then we all came together as kind of like a herd of horses. And then we purified what you would call all these uh, vectors of consciousness that were stuck in what you would call no-win situations, relationships that would just end in failure, projects that would just end in defeat, um, connections that would just end up, you know, splitting up if left unaddressed, right? And not given that like in, infusion, like a surgical infusion of pure love frequency to, to raise those orientations out of the mud so to speak and I'm, I'm giving visuals as much as I can so people can kind of visualize what I was discussing in all of these ancestral council meetings because they care about us so much they don't want to see us feeling disappointed or sad or feeling um, undermined or sabotaged right by weird strange unfortunate set of events it's it's unnecessary they would like to make this easier for us to have a challenge, but also be able to transcend and overcome, right? Those temporary setbacks so that you can have that 10th and 11th and 12th stage of the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell's perspective, you know, bring that boon of that breakthrough back to yourself and also your tribe, your village, right? Your relatives. And so they would love to support us to miraculously access our soul's success and to give the supernatural divine intervention credit. Like my whole purpose of writing all these books that I'm designed to write is I will give credit where credit is due and honoring and acknowledging the magnitude of the miracles that I've received just to survive. Those three other close brushes of death were attempts to take me out to take my life, right? Energy wanted to delete me off this planet. And the fact that I didn't have a full near-death experience in and of itself was a dispensation of grace. Why would energy want to take you out? Um, because I'm like a female Frodo. <laughs> uh, Frodo took that ring of power and returned it to the fires of Mount Doom, and it was a pretty hairy task. And so I got nicknamed the female Frodo when mm. I was in my my late 20s they're like oh my gosh you're like frodo and you're taking this heavy dense energy of the the darkness of separation consciousness and you're taking it and giving it back surrendering it back to the divine like take this from us right really big surrender alchemy transmutation of course i had massive amounts of help but you could say that those Ancestral Council end of life reviews was like a cheering squad. They pick us, right? When we have certain near death experiences, we've already been screened before we were born to know that we have the stamina or the endurance to handle these rigorous um, life trajectories. You don't. So I was being reminded of my strength on you, the other side. You don't think we choose these NDEs pre-birth? Well, not just choose them. I was also recruited. So, yes, we have our pre-birth planning where we also design our journey. We are also approached by consciousness, right? Particularly when you have large-scale missions that are very archetypal. I was recruited by certain levels of consciousness that felt that I would be a good fit for this assignment. Let me ask you some big picture questions to get where you stand or what your beliefs are. Do you believe that there is an energetic field on the other side that we all come from and return to and then and that collectively we are all one? Yes. However, because of the interference with this planetary's free will experiment, a lot of people don't have a clean transmission, clean transmission of a transition. And so I totally believe in, in conscious um, spiritual midwives that assist people to graduate across the veil. 
it's such a holy process to graduate. And there can be what you would call soul traps that are attempting, right, to reinforce reincarnation. Okay. And so that is a sophisticated form of a negative high frequency. And we've been purifying negative high frequency that's attempt to tamper in the lower 12 dimensions of the tree of life to force the species to reincarnate more than the original divine plan, right? Actually had as our passage back home to the source of, of all that is. So my mathematical and physics and quantum science background is in the original 12 sphere tree of life. And that that is a clean pathway through what we would call the return to zero point. And that through that return to grace point, zero point, grail point, that you do have a clean transition into those realms that don't have polarity. This is pretty shocking for people. And it, it may sound like a very advanced morphogenetic quantum physics formula. However, there's, like I said, a minimum of 12 spheres to clear and that tree of life body before you're really vibrating in a quantum unified field of oneness and wholeness. And all those other gradations, right, require support to ferry, <laughs> right, on the rainbow bridge. And so that's why some people have radiant near-death experiences, and that's why some people do not have pleasant near-death experiences, because they get stuck in the bardos, right, or they get um, stuck in the astral plane, or they get stuck in, um, like, their version of penance, if they had those religious belief systems. And then it's funny because when atheists, right, that don't have any quote unquote orientation have these radiant experiences, they're like, whoa, I didn't believe in any of this. Yeah. So Dr. Eben Alexander is a classic case, you know, of a Harvard scientist that then is moved to, you know, awe and wonder with the exquisite, you know, beauty of eternal consciousness. And I, I love stories like that. It's almost better, it seems, to be an atheist if you're going to have an NDE. <laughs> and my orientation, you know, was, quote unquote, uh, Protestant. And I did not study with indigenous cultures. So I didn't know anything about the star ancestors. Right. So that's why they came to me with these elaborate, gorgeous exquisite colorful masks to create that safety so that I would feel the kindness and the beauty and the benevolence and trust more that you know I wasn't like being um cross-examined because <laughs> I was I was put on the spot and it was like you know give us the report of like what's going on on that planet and I was like why do you want this data from from me you know, if if truth be told, uh, the species needs a lot of help. There's there's not a lot of love, right, in those family units, and where I should have had safety. You know, it was like World War Three. So there's your status report. You know, there was no basic safety for a lot of the children, and of course that was advocating to also remove human and trafficking. So we had. Lots of conversations because there's the correlation, right, of multiple family systems that are being impacted because of that industry. What is your take on all the star seeds that are here to assist at this time? Well, they're a beeline to me. <laughs> they hear me talk and they're like, oh, she gets it. You know, they're so grateful. They're like, somebody can see my soul. Like they say in Avatar, I see you. So the star walkers, the star borns, the star seeds, right? They have a, a cosmic or celestial origin. And when they hear me talk about the star ancestors, you know, sometimes they just weep. And so they have these spiritual IQs that are far more advanced and evolved than just the regular, you know, human set of social skills. And oftentimes they're so awake that they feel very awkward in human systems because they're still running 
old programs that they don't relate to. And so they meet me and they're like, oh, you understand my future self, which is right, my divine blueprint, which is my destiny. And they're so relieved that somebody on the planet can relate to them as they are, not how they present. So the star seeds have a tendency to cloak or veil their true presence because they don't want to experience unnecessary persecution because they know, right, they're different. And so I wrap them up in total acceptance. And I'm like, you came here with everything that you require to be successful in this divine endeavor that's brought you to this beautiful blue jewel. Okay, and now we're going to build that confidence. And now also we're going to build that integration with your own neural pathways and bioenergetic pathways so they can unite inside of you so you can have a solidarity of presence to then walk that destiny or walk that dharma or walk that life purpose into your everyday reality. But don't attempt it by yourself, right? They call us the spiritual midwives. And so I don't heal them and I don't fix them. There's this pre-existing knowing or gnosis that's just asking for support to rise up and take center stage, right? Or grab the helm of the wheel from the back seat. And so it's more about giving them permission to self-heal. And when they know that they're gotten, when they know that they're seen for who they truly are, that quickens or accelerates their self-healing capacity. And then they start putting themselves back together because they know that they actually have a calling that's going to make a significant difference because I can already see it. I have future memory and I just start describing to them, right, their success. And they just have this cathartic realization. Oh, so my soul's assignments like real. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, just like your love's real. So it's faith. It's a matter of faith. They lose faith. And then it's like, how do you help them re-believe in themselves again? And then they can re-believe in their own capacity to fire up, activate up, and turn themselves on. <laughs> and then that's the most rewarding experience because they're not giving their power away to some outside healer. Like They're like, I did that. And I'm like, heck yeah, and more. <laughs> Are you still... They have to feel that support. Are you still involved with assist? Well, if somebody's just starting out and they're brand new, I'll send them to those uh, trained professionals. And so um, that's what I would consider more mainstream, right? Spiritually transformative experiences, not so galactic. I'm more of the galactic, right? Interstellar and um, radical upgrade, right? For the human evolution. And yet I partner with all these other organizations so that everybody has the necessary help that they require to have that mentoring. Mm making sure that everyone's needs are being met. We have more than enough organizations. So we just delegate. <laughs> do you meditate or do anything to connect with the higher self completely while you're here? Yes, it's a daily act of surrender. And I consciously surrender over to this compendium. And so my final walk-in is the Devi aspect. And so it's asking Devi to take full uh, divine sovereignty, right? Over the Samavesha aspect, like Russian dolls, right? And the Moksha aspect, and then the Gayatri aspect. So I work from the top down, right? And so it's asking this consciousness of the master over self, which is the aspect of grace, to then wake down there's this terminology of waking that energy down. So I move a waterfall through my body of all these different highest self aspects, right? Who are locking in, clicking in like a, a numeric code, right? All five levels. And then I partner with the soul of the planet. So my circuitry must also partner with the grids or the circuitry of the planet because I'm in service to that planetary destiny. So I surrender my human will to the divine will of the planet every day. And also ensure it's kind of like a birth canal, 
that every morning, right, I give all of those walk-in highest self aspects permission to come in and organize and structure my human journey. And that is a deliberate, right, reinstall every morning. And also I request at night before I go to bed, people love this technique. You know, I know I'm going back to my other job, right, where I'm going to be sitting with councils all night long. And I go, well, this is what kind of miracles I'd love to see precipitate tomorrow. So if we can address these miracles tonight, right, in my evening councils, I'd love to come back in the morning with that awareness, that inspiration, that insight, that rush, right, of feeling like I am a true co-creator with all these other levels that are moving big divine blessings into manifest reality. And I'm actively asking for the cues, right? Show me the hints, show me the indicators, show me the, you know, coordinates so I can recognize, right, where you're asking me to plug in easily and effortlessly to make it fun and also to make it enjoyable so that I'm still in that process of re-encountering the cues. It's kind of like this, like I said, the Holy Grail quest. And so I'm leading myself into that remembrance. And if I ask for it the night before, right, then it's coalesced when all of those other conversations are taking place at night. And then it gets installed in the morning, which is why they've literally said ascension is a waking down. Debbie, what are you working on right now that you want people to know about? Well, what we're working on is also related to the other question that you asked. Our premise is to bring about the education for walk-ins so that it becomes a mainstream phenomenon for biological ascension. Think of it in terms of the walk-in is a more expanded dimension of our multidimensional consciousness. So basically in ancestral studies, we're talking about how the human race is embracing its multidimensionality and creating room in this body house for that multidimensional love to move in and take up residence. So you could call it a soul merge, right? You could call it embodying your highest self. You could call it awakening to your I am consciousness. We don't care. They're all versions of vertical alignment. And that means that the lower aspects are surrendering, right? Or yielding to the consciousness of the higher self aspects. And there is a marriage, an internal marriage that's taking place. Now, the ancients called this the Hieros Gamos, and it's the embodiment of the sacred marriage. So, part of what makes this vertical alignment available is when you're balanced in your conscious feminine and your conscious masculine, which we call a horizontal balancing, right? Of both your male and your female. As your male and female come into harmony in that divine union frequency inside of your own body, the Shiva, the Shakti, the sun and the moon, right? The day and the night. Once this axiotonal grid line is harmonized with the male and female, then you can start going up the elevator, right? Going up from floor one up to like, you know, four, floor 10 or floor 20. And that's when you can really start pulling down the dimensions of your higher self into your human body, which is what my walk-ins go through every single morning that I wake up. They reinstall back into my human vehicle. They reaffirm that we are here on mission and we recommit uh, ourselves to Gaia. So my contract is with the birthing of the whole planet. And so I need to ground with her grid systems every morning. And it's not just like regular Qigong. It's not like regular Tai Chi. It's planetary Qigong or you know, planetary yoga or planetary tantra. It's like I'm here for the planet's awakening and I receive those instructions not from heaven. I receive those instructions from the intelligence of the unified field and the body of the planet. And when most people figure out you draw 
right, from the divinity in the as above, you also draw from the divinity in the still below. The sandwich has two sides. Mm. So I'm like an Oreo every morning, right? Absorbing the guidance from the divinity of the as above and also absorbing the guidance from the wisdom of the whole planet and balancing, right? That I am both of the heavenly realms and also of this divinized earthly realm. And that's why they have the grid systems, right? They call it the telluric energies or the, the light grids in the planet. Earlier, you mentioned your books. Can you tell us the titles and where would we find them? Well, I'm a co-author, so I did not write an entire story by myself. I'm one of the 25 authors in this book called The Ancestors Within. <laughs> And we had a summit, the Ancestors Within Summit. So I'll put that in the chat box. My chapter 19 is called uh, What's Possible, Birthing the Divine Human's Tree of Life. And then I've also published my contactee experiences with more of the galactic, with Sheila Seppi's books, We the Experiencers, that are going to be published through the Galactic Alliance. So we have presentations on cosmic conversations from those chapters that we've written. Again, it's a volume, three set, and all the different authors are being interviewed. So we bring through the information in these panels and these summits, and then people can go back to, you know, the Amazon author profile for me, which I'll also put in the queue, and you can get the, the different volumes within the series. And then I'm available for consults and sessions through the Divine Union Foundation is more for couples, organizations, and businesses. And the Divine Union Academy is more for individuals and also um, teenagers, right? Or the millennials, as we say. That's www.divineunionacademy.com or www.divineunionfoundation.org. Devi, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Well, it's a really sexy one. <laughs> your soul can actually make love to your body. And so I also talk about soul tantra. And as we welcome more light into our cells, it's as if our spirit is making love to our human vehicle. And so uh, people have had orgasmic experiences with me. They've had like erotic experiences with the divine. And it just totally like rewires their availability to the beauty of joy and pleasure that's safe, right? It doesn't have to do with anything outside of them. And it's all about that sacred luminosity and radiance, like sensually flowing through their body like an ocean or a river or a creek. And then they feel so lit up with their own life force, right? Their own chi flow or their own prana that they're like, I didn't even have to do yoga, right? I, I didn't have like a kundalini awakening, but my grid systems started swimming, right? With rivers of love or rivers of light. And that is specific to the goddess lineages, and that's very much, right, the ancient sacred feminine. So I support people in awakening both their sacred femininity as well as their sacred masculinity and then the gestalt, right, of how they make love inside of you, right? Have that marriage consummate or union consummate inside of ourselves. Devi, thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. Mm. It's my pleasure to be continued. All right. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.